So that's Echuca, and it certainly is a great place to visit. However, we can't forget about Moema, the town on the other side of the river. Well, hang on. Wasps. We don't want those on board. Now, Moema was originally located two kilometres upstream from where it is at the moment. It was washed out and ruined by floods twice, once in 1867 and once in 1870. So it was moved to the higher ground where it sits today. But the worst of those two floods was the 1870 flood. And the water level there reached levels 13 metres higher than the average summer level, so it was a huge amount of water. Oh, and the name Moema, that comes from the Aboriginal word meaning place of the dead. And that's because of all the unmarked grave sites spread out all throughout the town. You see, when they moved the town, they put it on a hill nearby to help keep it out of future floods. The hill they put it on was actually an Aboriginal burial ground. Now, if you're wondering what happened to the river, and what happened to the trial craft, well, we, we ran out of water just a little way back. We got just up near Barma, just up from Echuca, and the water levels got just too low to continue on. So now I'm back in the Nissan, and we're heading towards a place called um, the Narrows. And it's called that because this stretch of the river gets a whole lot more narrow than the rest of it. And the river banks are very, very low, also compared to what we've seen uh, in the past. And the reason they're so low is because this part of the river is very new compared to the rest of it. You see, the water used to travel way inland at one stage, but because of the, the way the land has changed and the contours of the land have, have formed over the last couple of thousand years, the river's had to take a, a new course, and that new course that it took is the one we're travelling on now. And because the river banks are so new and so low, that means that the first sign of flood, the water rises up and flows over the banks and spreads out all throughout this land. And it means that, um, apparently, so I've read that there's water as far as the eye can see. So the forest we're in is called the Barma State Forest and we have the Milua on the other side of the river. And the interesting thing about these two forests is that you can find flora and fauna here that's usually only found in areas with three times this place as annual rainfall. Um, but this whole area gets away with it because of the huge floods they receive, or used to receive. You see the problem is now, the floods don't come anymore. Just to give you all a bit of useless information, the Murray's thought to be the second most windy river in the world, with a distance from the ocean to the sea by river three times that compared to what it would be driving in a car. And it's also thought to be the slowest river in the world, with a fall rate from Albury all the way down to within 160 kilometres from the ocean at just 15 centimetres for every kilometre. So it's certainly not much. Then for the last 160 kilometres all the way down to the ocean, the fall rate's only 2.5 centimetres for every kilometre. So with a fall rate like that, you can certainly understand why the river is thought to be the slowest flowing in the world. Now you see groups of old logs like this all over the place around here. And they're here for one of two reasons. The first reason is the loggers would come through and they'd see a, a group of trees like this, so close to the river, great location, and easy to transport to the barge, which then would take them downstream. The other reason is the paddle steamers would come through and they'd run out of wood. And they'd need huge amounts of wood to restock their boilers. So they'd pull up, cut them down, restock their load, and then carry on. Now the paddle steamers would use up to one tonne of wood every hour. And sometimes they'd be working for 12 hours at a time. So it's a huge amount. Or another way to look at it is they would use roughly six tons of wood for every 16 kilometers traveled. So there's reasons for the, the paddle steamers and the loggers and the, the popularity of the railway that came through all throughout Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland about the same time, that forests like these on both sides of the river really became totally extinct and wiped out completely. So the paddle steamers would travel up and down the river taking wool, general cargo and wood, which made it sometimes very hard for the loggers to get their, their wood transported to another location because of the lack of the paddle steamers. So to get around this, what they would do was, was the paddle steamers would leave behind a barge. The loggers would then fill it up, push it out in the river, 
I let it float down with the current. And to keep it in the center of the channel, they would have this huge long chain that they dragged behind. And because it was so heavy, it would constantly roll and keep it in the center of the river and in the deep channel. So um, they let off their, their barge to float down the river. And then when the paddle stand was free on its way up, it would just pick up the barge and then take it back to where it had to go. Now sometimes when the paddle steamers were running low on wood, but they didn't want to cut their own, cut their own supplies, they would look out for these huge log stacks left on the riverbank by the loggers. So they could then reload their stack and then carry on. But if the loggers weren't around, what would happen is the, the paddle boat captain would let off one huge toot on his horn. And that would indicate to the loggers that the paddle steamers have got some wood, but you weren't around, so next time we come back, we'll pay for it then. Now one logger got completely sick of the paddle steamer captains taking his wood piles and not paying for them, stealing them. So what he did to get his own back was hide sticks of jelly knot all throughout his wood stacks up and down the river. And then when the paddle steamer captains didn't pay for it, they blew themselves up. That happened twice. There's something just up here on the riverbank a little bit on a tree, a marking. When I can find it, I'll give you a look. Well, we've just put up on the side of the road and got a red belly black snake down on the track and um, you don't want to ever go anywhere near these because they're very very dangerous but if you see one on the side of the road you can certainly pull your car up if you don't harm it or scare it have a bit of a look and you can learn a lot from them So you see he's not very frightened, he's in pretty good condition, a little skinny, but obviously there's not too much to eat around here when the area's in such a huge drought, but as I said, look at them, but certainly don't touch them. If you see one when you're bushwalking, just stand still, if he's a fair way away, just slowly walk back and he'll slither off. But certainly never try and pick them up, never prod them with a stick, just leave them alone. Alright, let's try and find this tree then. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, that way you'll get notified to all my new videos when I upload them. And if you want to contact me, you can do so through my website, the link's in the description below. See you next time.